Hey, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the worship. I know it's not the same. It's just not the same worshiping at home as it is here. But you know what? When you fill the house with your praises, then God will come. Even if you're in your pajamas, like Ben said, and eating bacon and eggs. Glory to God. We're going to do our offering this morning. So get something in your hand there at home. Get your credit card or your check or whatever. So you've got a point of contact for your faith. And let's believe God together. Anybody know why we do this? I was waiting for the answers to come back because you, you have to release your faith by speaking. Always remember that. Faith comes by hearing, but faith goes out or is activated by speaking. So let's say the word of God over our finances. You worked all week <clears throat> for your finances to pay the bills, and God wants to be involved in your finances, and he's really, really good at being involved in finances. He paves the streets with gold. So a guy like that's a good guy to invest with. Okay, so let's say it together. I sow my finances into the kingdom of God. Every dollar will produce for God and for me. The gospel will be preached, lives will be changed, bodies will be healed, and Satan will be stopped. It will produce for me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will God give back to me that I might give again? I count it as done in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Glory to God. Make sure you got your Bible there today or your phone or your electronic Bible. You know, I, I've encouraged people for many years to, uh, when you hear somebody speaking, take notes. Um, you know, it's a, it's a simple learning process that we discovered many, many years ago uh, that when you take notes, you retain a whole lot more. So I just always tell people, you know, do something where you're taking notes, writing in the margin of your Bible, or, I mean, for me, I type my notes when I'm hearing somebody speak because I type faster than I write, and then I can't read my own writing afterwards when I'm trying to write because my writing is worse than chicken scratch. But writing something down or typing it out, not only do you have the high points, but your brain retains it much, much better. And so uh, remember to do that. I encourage you to do that. We've been talking about uh, moving more into spiritual things, baptism of the Holy Spirit and so forth, but... It was interesting, yesterday, just in my quiet time with the Lord, I, something kept coming up, and um, so I'm going to interrupt that series on spiritual things to talk about the Lord of the Breakthrough today. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I, again, grab your Bible so you can follow me through on this. I was sitting there yesterday in my quiet time, and uh, I was reminded of something. When we met, there was a bunch of us met Um, uh, uh, leaders, pastors from uh, different parts of Alberta on New Year's Eve. And we met in in, uh, Lethbridge. And we we try and do this about every three months. And it's a bunch of prophetic apostolic guys come together and, and say, what's God saying? You know, what are we... What's God doing and how do we pray into the situation and, and, and uh, you know, how do we declare, what, how do we release what heaven wants into our province of Alberta? Primarily, it's, a, it's an Alberta thing right now. And so we got together on, on New Year's Eve. Now, you have to remember that on New Year's Eve, or just, it was just before that at Christmas time, that they were saying, okay, there's more COVID, there's more lockdowns, there's more restrictions, uh, et cetera. And so we came together and... You know, you're, you've just kind of been dealing with this. Like at that time, we'd been dealing with it since March. Um, and so we're all kind of thinking, at least I was definitely thinking, oh, you know, okay, we really need to pray and, and maybe repent and intercede for this and, uh, you know, come together. And, of course, we could only have 15% of the church. And so uh, as many as, the, I think their church holds five or 600 or something like that. So there's probably 100 and uh, something of us. And... Uh, I remember as we started to praise and worship, you know, and we moved out of being, uh, thinking about all those things that we were supposed to do. We really, like when we do these meetings, we really just kind of throw it open. We sort of have an agenda, but we actually really don't. We really come together to seek the Lord, to praise him and to worship him, and then to see what comes up. And of course, you know, most of us have been in the ministry for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years or more. 
And so we just really trust the Lord. Okay, wh- whatever you want to do, whatever, whatever is on your heart. You want us to praise the whole service, we'll do it. You want us to pray and um, you know, intercede? Do you want us to make declarations? Um, do, you want, do, you, do you give somebody the word where somebody gets up and really just you know, lays something out? <clears throat> and um, so we're all sort of there and we're all sort of prepared. We're all sort of had in our mind which way we thought it was going to go. And we started to praise him. And as we praised him, the atmosphere changed. And the praise just got, it just went up and up and up and up. And so instead of talking about these issues or, or even interceding for any of them, as we praised, the, the, the high praises began. And then we went into a throne room thing. We went into the, you know, the, the presence of the Lord in the, in the worship got stronger and stronger and stronger to where you get into that place where it's just like, oh, Lord. And I remember at one point getting up and, and reading and singing out of Revelation where they're all singing blessing and honor and glory and power, you know. And you know what happened? We went for two and a half hours. We went for almost three hours that night praising and worshiping, shouting, declaring, and the joy of the Lord filled the house. And none of us expected it. And something happened that night. We, we, we touched heaven's realm. We touched what heaven was doing. We touched <coughs> this whole other thing that heaven was already set up for that was working. And when, when we focused on what God was doing, it's like we were lifted up from all this stuff over here that was so you know, discouraging and dis- depressing and, and okay, we got to pray and intercede. And, and God just took us out of that and, and put us over here into the, into the, the heaven thing where well, I, I remember coming out of it afterwards and we were sitting in the green room afterwards talking and it's, you know, whatever it was, 11 o'clock at night on New Year's Eve. And we all were kind of looking at each other like, did you notice we never really prayed for anything? We never really, what we had was a Holy Ghost New Year's Eve party. And the interesting thing about that, and this is, what, this is what struck with me, it was almost a shock to me. It was so unexpected. So instead of us hammering away at things from this side, God showed us basically what was happening for his, from his side. And I'll never forget that. It's still, it's still there in my mind that we all came out of that night so happy and so carefree because we were able to tap into the kingdom of God that was here. And that's what the Lord reminded me of yesterday morning. I'm sitting there yesterday in the morning. You guys know this. One of my favorite things, uh, probably the, in the top three favorite things, one of them's Thanksgiving, um, but probably <coughs> something that I know, I know the best for myself and what I've studied over the years is walking in the supernatural, you know, and believing God and, and what happens when you pray in tongues and all that kind of stuff and and so I'm really looking forward this week to talking about that. And yesterday I felt like the Lord said, no, you need to, you need to step over for a minute into uh, the Lord of the breakthrough. You need to step over for a minute into what happened to you on New Year's Eve when you guys stepped into my kingdom and all those other things, listen to me, they all ceased to have the, the, the weight and the gravity that they had before we had that meeting. In other words, all the bad stuff we're dealing with, you know. And here we are in, in lockdowns again, and they're saying this, and they're saying that, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and the Lord yesterday morning, he was like, you need to remember who I am. You need to remember this about me. So I, wanna, I want you to go with me to uh, 2 Samuel 5. Because this is the thought that was coming to me yesterday morning. And of course, I've heard preaching on this. I don't know if I've ever preached on it. In 2 Samuel 5, it talks here about the God of the breakthrough. So grab your phone or your tablet or your book, the Bible. In 2 Samuel 5 and verse 17. Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed King David, King, pardon me, over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. You know, there's something interesting right there. Every time that the Lord moves you to another level, the enemy will come to contest that level before you get established. So David has just been made king, and the Philistines immediately come and try and stop this from happening (coughs) before he gets developed and uh, uh, established. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. 
the Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. It's an interesting thing about the valley of Rephaim. It's called in Psalms the valley of weeping, but the Rephaim, as you know, were the giants. And so the valley of the Rephaim was, of course, where the giants lived. And then Joshua and his crew dealt with a bunch of them. And obviously David dealt with a bunch of them and his mighty men, as you find out a little bit later on. But David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? Let me jump back to that Rephaim thing for a minute. Oftentimes, the very place where God wants us to get the victory is the place where the giants are where we least want to go. And typically, or, or, or consistently sometimes, those giants are things that we face in ourselves. There are things that we face that, that, that we think, I don't know if I can beat this thing. Why do I have to come back to the valley of the Rephaim? But God brings you back to that place because the victory that you get there becomes something that you can hold on to and stand on so that the next time God says, I want you to go to that valley, yeah, I, I can go there. And, and the Bible says this in Psalms. It says that when you and I pass through the valley of, of uh, weeping, that we make it a place of joy and we release springs of fresh water. So in other words, when you conquer your giant, you never have to face that giant again because it becomes a stepping stone of something that, that you're, you've overcome. You've, you've earned the authority by overcoming. You know, it's one thing to give somebody authority and then let them walk in that authority. It's a whole other thing when somebody earns the authority because when you earn authority, you have respect in the spirit realm. You have respect from the demons that know, okay, we don't mess with him in that area because he's got authority over this. And, and I encourage you, you know, one of the things that, that I've said this a, a number of times over the last year, but one of the things that we're dealing with in the body of Christ is this, uh, it's a combination of fear, discouragement, and dismay. That this, this, this spirit that's behind all this COVID stuff and behind the manipulation of the global order and all that, uh, you know, it, it tends to bring discouragement and dismay. And I'm telling you, we are having in the body of Christ a lesson. Oh, are we having a lesson on when to stand in faith no matter what it looks like. That we are not moved by what we see. We're moved by what God says. We're moved by what his word says. That we stand in having done all to stand. This is, a, this is a lesson for the whole body right now. That we have to do this. That we have to learn to rebuke the discouragement and say, I refuse to give place to that. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when you, you really hook into all the world's things and you watch the world's media and you, you pay attention to that, it'll get you down after a while. And that's why I've encouraged our church now for months, you know, get your nose in your Bible. Why? Because you'll be able to stand against that discouragement. And that's part of the reason why, you know, I believe the Lord brought that up yesterday morning where he just showed me on New Year's Eve, boom, you can step over into my realm. Those things will still be there, but they won't touch you the same. You can walk in the spirit of faith. You can walk in the spirit of, of overcoming by tapping into that kingdom. I believe that's why the Lord had me teach on in January and February of this year, the kingdom, the laws of the kingdom, that the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now, and if we will give place to that kingdom, that kingdom will manifest in our life and in our family. You'll get rid of fear, you'll get rid of discouragement, and you'll get rid of dismay. <clears throat> no matter what's happening around you. And once, once we start to pull from that kingdom, then it causes that to manifest in our lives. So it causes it to manifest in your family, causes it to manifest in your business, that your business will start to work better than other people's businesses that seem to really be struggling. Why? Because we're bringing the things of the kingdom of heaven in by faith and declaring and walking in that realm. So David inquired of the Lord, verse 19, saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into a hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to baal Perazim, and David defeated them there, and he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place baal Perazim. Now, if you look up the meaning of the words Baal Perism, the word Baal means Lord. You know how they serve the Baals? It just, the word Baal just means Lord. And Perism, of course, means breakthrough. So David, God revealed himself to David here as the Lord of the breakthrough. I think one of the things that we've got to remember 
is that heaven's agenda hasn't been stopped by a, by a virus. Heaven's agenda, really, just stop and think about it for a minute, hasn't been stopped or put on hold by the plans of wicked men who are using this virus to their own advantage to make societal changes and to, to do the great reset and, and, and to change the finances of the world and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Heaven's agenda hasn't been pushed to the side because the devil has come in and, and he's pushing his thing. And, and our mistake, and we all make it, myself included, is that because we're flesh and blood and because we're tied into the world system and because, you know, the God of this world who controls the thoughts or who has right to influence the thoughts, imaginations, pre precepts, ideas of humanity, we, we get hooked over into that thing. And it takes conscious effort to step out of it. But when you start to do it, you find out you get a little stronger and a little better and a little better to where those things don't, they don't, they don't pull on you the same anymore. Again, which is why I've told our church so many times, don't be always going on the news. Don't be always looking at the latest number of this and the cases of that and what this, because if you do that, you're going to pull your faith right down out the window. I mean, you'll literally just pull yourself down where you'll be like, oh God, is it ever going to change? Is there ever going to be a breakthrough? So heaven's agenda hasn't been stopped. And I want you to think about this. How many times in the Bible do we see God's people hemmed in and on the verge of destruction and then the Lord of the breakthrough breaks through for them? Where suddenly where they, they cry out to God, they humble themselves, they pray, and the Lord breaks through for them. And you know one of the mistakes that I think that we make is we don't, we don't take those stories that we read and, and learned about in Sunday school and that we read as part of our devotions and bring them into today and think, wait a minute, I'm in a story. I'm in a story that God's writing today with the body of Christ. I totally believe that when we get to heaven, God's going to have all these stories, the ones that are in the written word, but then he's going to have your story and my story, and there's going to be heroes, and there's going to be failures, and there's going to be all these things, but we're still in the story, you guys. We're still in the story, and the same God that was there for David 3,000 years ago is there for us today, but we don't, we don't put that together. And that's, that's where you've got to stop for a minute and think, okay, wait a minute. All things are possible to him that believes. We're still in the dispensation of faith. Okay, God, how do I do this? How do I overcome this? What do I have to do to get you going on my side? And, you know, I believe that when enough of us begin to stand up and, and pray and intercede and wake up, really the church is, is waking up in the Western world, we will see the changes on a massive scale. But for now, I'm talking about you and I seeing some of these changes in our own lives where the Lord of the breakthrough comes and starts to work. I believe there's some breakthroughs coming, you guys. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. But what I'm talking about right now is you and I standing and believing together for your breakthrough and for, you know, whatever it is, your family, your business, your finances, or whatever. So God's plan for redemption of mankind hasn't been altered one bit. I, I, I wrote this down here. We know that God sees the end of things right from the beginning. And I want you to think about this for a minute because for most of us, we see what's happening in the world. Like I said, it's discouraging. But the Bible says that God is omniscient. So omniscient means completely and totally all-knowing. So he knows everything. He knows not only what you're thinking right now, he knows every thought you will ever have in your life. So apply that to what's happening with the devil. See, the devil comes and does his plan and messes things up and makes it look really bad, but God knew what the devil was going to think before he created Lucifer. So all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. So the devil's trying to pull a fast one on us but God's already a thousand moves ahead of him. God saw all of his plans. God saw all of his steps. And God already made arrangements for all of those things. That's how he could write the end from the beginning. That's how he could write the whole book and say, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen in these times. Here's what's going to happen in those times. And, the, and one third of the Bible is prophecy. God could write it because he knew everything that he would do. He knew everything that the enemy would do in response. And he knew everything that he planned to undo what the enemy's response was. Don't ask me to say all that again. So <clears throat> when you realize that God is omniscient, it causes you to stop and think, okay, so then if my God is omniscient, 
I need to put my faith back over there in him instead of going, oh, why is God letting this happen? I, I've got to tell you, I have to admit to, to saying to the Lord, you know, over the course of this last year, God, uh, it ain't doing very good down here. And feeling a little bit like, why aren't you doing more? Like, there's some bad stuff happening, you know? Why aren't you doing more? <clears throat> and I, I have to remind myself, he already knows this, and he's got things set up for this. He's got plans set up for this, but what I have to deal with is my attitude about, well, why isn't he breaking through for me? And you guys, it's really important. We are all dealing with that to some degree here in the Western world because for the first time, our faith is being challenged to the core. For the first time, some of the things that we believe and the freedoms that we've just taken here in the West, you know, for literally decades are all of a sudden being challenged right in front of us that we might not have those freedoms anymore. And we want God to intervene. Well, you and I have got to get back over into faith and say, wait a minute, God has a plan for this. Always remember, it doesn't matter what you're going through, God has a plan that'll bring you out of that into what he has for you. Doesn't matter what the devil does. Doesn't matter what happens in your... God always, always, always has a plan for you to succeed no matter how far into the rough you are. No matter how far into the discouragement you are. There's a way for you and I to come out of that. And one of the keys for that is to turn our face towards him, begin to praise him, begin to worship him, and begin to thank him for the word. I've noticed myself over the last couple of, uh, probably a month, I've noticed myself bringing up the scriptures again that I've used for many years on hope. <clears throat> that, the, the hope of God. You know that the, there's many scriptures that kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. In the Holy Ghost now abides these three, faith, hope, and love. And so I bring those up and say, Lord, I want to thank you that I have a hope that's anchored behind the veil, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which is entered behind the presence behind the veil or anchored behind the veil. Let me ask you a question. How's your hope right now? Has you been discouraged? Has your hope been pushed down and down? Because faith is the substance of what you and I hope for. So if the enemy can steal your hope, then faith has nothing to land on. If the enemy can come and just, you know, he doesn't just do it all in one day. He just comes and little by little, he chips away at you over the course of days and weeks and months till you just finally figure out, ah, oh, there's just, what's the use, you know? Dear God, I just hope something happens. But you find your hope. And I'm telling you, that's where you get out the, the, the scriptures. Find yourself three scriptures on hope. And stir those things up again. What are we doing? We're, we're creating an atmosphere for the Lord of the breakthrough to begin to operate on our behalf. And that's for somebody right now. How's your hope? If your hope is down, grab a hold of the, of the scriptures on hope. Just go to you know, your concordance or, or go to Bible Gateway and type in the word hope. And all the places where it is comes up and pick yourself three out of that and stir your hope up again. Get your hope back because when you get your hope back up, then faith has something to land on. Now, <clears throat> let's go uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 7. It, it's so encouraging when you read these stories in the scripture all the way through, and you know, I was lucky, uh, I, I gave my heart to the Lord at seven years of age in our, our little Baptist Sunday school here in Calgary, and I remember all these stories over and over and over again, um, being read these stories in Sunday school, and the little flannel graph thing that they had up, you know, and watching all that, I remember the stories, and those, those words are eternal, they get inside you, they never leave, and when you read them all these years later, there's even more meaning that comes out. There's more. And uh, so I want to read you a, a story. This isn't um, a common story, really. But when I was uh, praying about Lord of the Breakthrough, uh, I, I, this is the one that came up. So in 1 Samuel 7, if you remember, in the, in the chapters before this, the Philistines had defeated Israel in battle. And the worst thing that could possibly happen happened. They took the ark which to Israel was the very, you know, sense of God. The Philistines would bring their idols. Matter of fact, in battle back then, the armies, the, the soldiers, they would bring their home idols thinking that if I bring these idols, they'll give me power. 
So these idols are here to help me and protect me. Well, Israel knew because of the history of the ark, they knew about the power of God. They knew about the, the story of, uh, uh, of Moses and, and the ark and what the ark did and the fire that was by night and the cloud by day. So for them, when the ark was taken, it was, it was a completely disheartening thing. Well, you know what happened. God plagued the Philistines, <clears throat> and uh, they sent the ark back. But there was an interesting thing here that happened in these chapters beforehand. Israel, of course, was defeated and I wrote this down, not only on the battlefield, but in their hearts. Israel was defeated in their hearts. They were afraid, they were discouraged, and they were without hope. Okay, so you want to get the picture before we pick it up in 1 Samuel 7, that all this stuff has happened. The ark has come back, but Israel is a defeated nation, and the Philistines are their overlords. Okay, so they're, they're without hope, they're without uh, faith, they're without any sense of national strength or unity, <clears throat> and they're discouraged. But notice here in 1 Samuel 7 and verse 3. Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to mitzvah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. And if you read it again before this, Samuel had been established as a prophet. And the Bible says something very interesting. It says that not one of Samuel's prophetic words fell to the ground. In other words, every prophetic word that Samuel had came to pass. So Israel is looking to the man of God, and they're saying, we don't have anywhere else to go. We lost the battle there, you know, and... Uh, Man, we're disenfranchised, we're discouraged, we're without hope. So Samuel says, all right, everybody get together. <clears throat> and verse 4 says this, So the children of Israel put away the Baals, the Ashtoreths, serve the Lord. And Samuel said, gather everybody to Mitzvah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mitzvah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day. And said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mitzpah. Okay, so let's, let's stop here. They, Israel has been defeated by the Philistines. They come to the place where they're, they're, they've got no hope left. And they say to Samuel, you know, or Samuel says to them, look, if you guys want to be restored, you've got to come back to the, to the Lord God of Israel. You've got to come back to Jehovah. <clears throat> Isn't it? You know, it's almost sad but they had to come to the end of themselves. And they had to come to the realization that they were doing things wrong before God by serving other gods. Before they got desperate enough to cry out to God and say, you know, whatever you want us to do, we'll do. Samuel was there the whole time. So as Samuel's there, they're serving uh, Baal and they're serving Ashtoreth. And so, you know, it's like we have, we have Samuel and he does Jehovah, but we, it's okay if we serve Baal and we serve Ashtoreth, it's not... But it got so bad that Samuel said, okay, you guys ready to repent? It, it's a good thing sometimes to check in our own lives. Am I going through something right now that's so hard because there's something that I just refuse, there's something that I just won't turn from, there's something that I'm just like, you know what? It, I, I heard a guy say this many, many years ago. He said, people change when they hurt enough they have to. They also change when they learn enough they're able to. But I wonder how many times for, for you and me, it gets to the place where we're like, oh, this is so bad, I guess I better seek God. You know, the old joke was, well, you know what? It's so bad, we better pray. And the other guy said, really, has it come to that? And let me tell you something. Long before it comes to that, you should be praying about it. But again, the, the picture here is with these guys, that they got to the place where they're like, you know, there's nothing else. We better go back to God. So check your own life and find out, is there things that the Lord's dealing in, with in my life that I just don't let him deal with? <clears throat> and it gets bad enough to where you have to change. So they gathered together to the Lord at Mitzpah, and they said, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mitzpah. So Samuel, apparently, 
judged them and said, okay, well, we judge that sin. And however he did it, whatever it was that he, but they acknowledged it before the Lord Samuel judged it as wrong. And look at what it goes on to say. <clears throat> or let me say this. So you, here you've got the children of Israel. They're humbling themselves before God. They're gathered together to repent and ask forgiveness. And they've stopped ser- serving idols and are turning back to God. Look at verse 7. When the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mitzpah, the Lord of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So here you have them gathering together to seek God. And there's so many principles here that that you see. They're gathered together to seek God, to humble themselves, to call out. And again, as soon as they do, The Philistines hear about Israel gathering together. And think about this. The Philistines were their overlord. So the Philistines think to themselves, well, why else would Israel be gathering together unless they're going to rebel against us? To war, Philistines. So here these guys are at a church meeting, at a prayer meeting, and the word gets out that the Philistine army is actually coming right towards them. I'm going to tell you something else. When you and I turn back to God in something, the enemy will come and try and grab that thing and, 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 and stop you from successfully keeping going by bringing something fearful, by bringing something discouraging. As, as soon as you turn to address something, oftentimes the enemy will come and he'll make it worse than it is or he'll go, you don't want to go there. You know that hurts. I, I remember... Hearing Brother Rodney Howard Brown say something years ago, you know, we we were in revival meetings and um, people would be lying on the floor just weeping. I mean, weeping and weeping and crying and gut cries like they were crying something out. And he said this, he said, we've discovered in the revival that when God begins to move in people's hearts, if what happened to them You know, maybe when they were a child, maybe they were abused, maybe they were raped, maybe they were beaten, maybe they were, you know, an orphan and and rejected and all that. He said, if it was painful going in, it's often painful coming out. And, you know, I'm not talking necessarily about devils coming out, but whatever that situation was, and God, God speeds it up. It's not like you have, you know... Days and weeks of agony, God can do in an hour or or just a week what what was built into you and I for years. But I'll never forget when he said that. When it's painful going in, it's often painful coming out. And you know what? You and I don't like to face that pain because we don't want to have to deal with it again. But I'm telling you, when you're moving ahead in God, he's going to, and you open yourself and you humble yourself, the enemy will come and try and go, you don't want to go there. You know that you can't beat this. You know you've been dealing with, but if you keep pushing towards God, God will, it'll be painful, but God will bring that thing out. He'll, he'll, he'll get you free from it. And so, uh, you know, that's on a personal level, but look at what happens here. So the Philistines come together and they hear about this and they go, they come up to fight with them. Verse 8. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now notice something here. Because because they've repented, because they've humbled themselves, if you go back to what... uh, The principle is that as they humble themselves and you get the sin out of the way, when you get the sin out of the way, then the Spirit of the Lord can come and move because there's nothing blocking you and Him. You know? And uh, he said this later on to Solomon. If my people who are called by my name, and look at the progression, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So he's got four things that have to happen. Then I will come, I will hear their prayer, I will forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. So there's four things that he outlines there. Well, we don't see all of those in these passages, but you can tell by what's about to happen here that they humble themselves because their sin is dealt with. The enemy comes right away. The Philistines come right away to try and leave them in that because they're about to lose their hold. You remember this in Jesus' ministry? That when the spirits, you know, the the, the man brings his, his boy 
to Jesus and says, uh, you know, my, here's my boy who is often uh, has a spirit that casts him into the water and into the fire. <clears throat> and it says that when, the, when the, the boy or the spirit saw Jesus, he immediately cast him down and manifested. And we see that again and again and again. When Jesus would go to bring deliverance, the spirit would manifest to try and mess things up, to try and make it look like it's not going not gonna to work. <clears throat> and, of course, the, 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 Jesus says, come out, and the spirit left him, and it, it says, as though one is dead, to where many said he is dead. So it, it always looks worse before it gets better. So if you're dealing with something right now, let me tell you, as you turn towards the Lord, let's, let's just pick discouragement. You know, your business is, has struggled because of what's happened over the course of the last year. We got new restrictions and, and all that kind of stuff. When you turn towards the Lord, the enemy's going to come and say, what's the use? And he's going to try and keep you in that discouragement. But I'm telling you something. On the other side of you turning towards the Lord is the Lord of the breakthrough. On the other side of that thing is the Lord of the breakthrough who's going, I'm still here. My stuff still works. Don't give up and don't quit. And of course, we've seen him do it many times in the nation, but we, we don't, as I said earlier, we don't apply it so much to ourselves. <clears throat> so Samuel cried out, verse 9, to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. Can you imagine the picture of that? Can you imagine they're there and they're in the crowd, you know, everybody that's there, possibly thousands and thousands of them, and Samuel's doing an offering. Meanwhile, they're hearing horses and chariots and the clinking of armor back over here, and they're in a prayer meeting. Like, who's got a sword? Who's got a spear? Here they are, and, and it's like, God, if you don't come through. I wonder if we ever let ourselves get to the place where God has to come through or if we subvert the plan. You know, if we, we go ahead and do something, uh, okay, well, let's, just, let's, let's do this and make this happen. So we actually really don't need him to come through. I wonder sometimes if, if God waits for the kind of faith that steps out, that if he doesn't come through, you go down. And of course, again, as I said, in North America, we're really good in the Western world at just taking care of everything ourselves, and so we don't need him as much as what many others possibly do. <clears throat> but God has something better when we'll, when we'll move towards him and let him in. And look at what it says here. The Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. That's a terrible translation. The New King James, well, the, the, it's, it's just not good at all. Let me tell you something. There was a lot more in that thunder than just loud noise. If you look the word up, the word for confuse here, <clears throat> and there's a whole, I just, I went through pretty much every English translation on this verse to find out what, what the more was. Because I thought, wait a minute, thunder doesn't confuse people. I mean, if it's just a really big loud thunder, it's like, well, that was something, okay. But we're in the middle of fighting. Testosterone's here. You're ready to fight. We're going to take these guys down. What's a, what's, a, what's a thunderstorm? Had to be something much more than that. So the word confuse here means to make a noise so loud that it vexes, breaks, consumes, crushes, and destroys. Like the word is just, it's is just a, there's just so much more meaning in the word than what it says, it confused them. Many translations say this, the Lord thundered with a mighty voice that day. In other words, God spoke something on behalf of Israel. Do you remember when Jesus said, Father, glorify your name, and, and, and the Father said, I have glorified it, I'll glorify it again. And the Bible says some people thought it thundered. Well, in this one, there was no question at all that there was, that there was a noise. There was something in God's words. There was something in God's voice. There was something there. You remember the Bible says that the voice of the Lord splits the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord breaks the mountains and and. and opens the seas, the voice of the Lord. So God sees what's about to happen, that the Philistines are about to potentially wipe out his uh, inheritance, his people, and when they cry out, he speaks from heaven. To me, that's the Lord of the breakthrough. And when I get to heaven, I'm gonna ask him, what did you say? Because I believe it was the voice of the Lord that spoke. And it so discomfited them that they couldn't think anymore. They couldn't, they couldn't rationale, they couldn't 
Who's, who's my enemy? Who's my friend? Who's my... And you see that happen a number of times. Remember when, uh, when um, Jonathan and his armor bearer went up through the slippery and the steep place. And the Bible says the same thing. There was a great shaking. That word shaking there is the word a terror. It's literally abject terror. And then the Bible says that every man's sword was turned against his, his what is it that God does? And you guys, this is the kind of thing that we're waiting for. This is the kind of thing that we're saying, okay, God, we've seen stuff happen in our day. You know, this is what we're waiting for. What's it going to take? What do we have to do to prepare this place where you come through and you do something? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced there's things that the Lord is holding back right now until it builds up enough where he can release his thunder. I, I, I'd never thought of it before this, but God used sound warfare to completely disable the army. Think about it. God used sound warfare. I don't know if, if you've ever looked into this. If you go online, and, and it's quite interesting, we now have sound weapons that can be aimed across a, a, a battlefield at someone that will literally rupture people's eardrums. Like the sound waves, we can create and focus sound waves. They can do the same thing with heat. They have weapons that they can focus on somebody, and when the ray hits you, it starts to heat up, and it'll literally boil you. These are the things, that, of course, that, that, I mean, they're terrible things, but God invented sound warfare here 3,000 years ago for the sake of his people. And the men of Israel went out of Mitzpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as Beth Car. So the Israelites see what's happening to the Philistines and they rush to take advantage of it, forcing them back into their own country. And look at verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. The word Ebenezer means the Lord helps. But notice the next verse. Verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Now, doesn't that make you want to stop? Uh, for me, it does as a Bible student to go, okay, so how many days were the days of Samuel? Because if, if the, the hand of the Lord was against them, like if Samuel ruled for five years, well, that, that's pretty good, you know. The Bible says that in the springtime, kings go out to war. I looked this up. The minimum that Samuel, at this point, from this point on, the minimum that Samuel was the prophet of God judging Israel, last of the judges, was 20 years. In my studies yesterday, I looked at, at uh, um, references that said that Samuel judged Israel up to 60 years. So let's round it off right in the middle and say for 40 years. For 40 years. No, that's too big. Most of us can't believe that. For 20 years. We know it was a minimum of 20 years. For 20 years with this one act, the God of the breakthrough secures Israel's safety for the next 20 years. Can you see what that... I, I believe the Philistines were just too scared to come into Israel anymore. They'd go home, you know, from the ones that lived through it, would go home and, and say, uh, you know, the, the, Gath, the king of Gath and the king of Eglon would come together and, and uh, okay, so where do you want to attack this year? Well, do you want to go and attack the south of Israel? No, 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 no. Remember what happened before with that Israel, with that Samuel guy? Remember we went up there and then that thing happened from heaven and we couldn't hear anymore and all of us were, were, were deaf and we couldn't think straight and the, Israels took out a, the Israelis took out a whole bunch of us? Now, let's go somewhere else. Let's go south. Let's go towards Egypt. Let's go attack the Amorites. They're always a good bunch to attack. The, you can just see the picture in the mind here, year after year after year for somewhere between 20 and 40 years. Talk about a victory for the Lord of the breakthrough, for the sake of the people. Hallelujah. So let me tell you something today. Refocus on heaven's agenda. Get back to heaven's agenda. Get back to, to, okay, Lord, you know what? For many of us, we lived such a, a placid Christian life for so many years that we haven't had to stand up and just really go to town with our faith until this last 12 months 
when things were coming against us. First of all, it was the fear of the virus. You know, oh, you're going to get the virus and everybody's going to die. Well, that didn't happen. Over 99% of the people that get it get well. <clears throat> And then there was the lockdowns. Okay, well, my business, what about my business? Well, then that kept going on, you know? And then we, were, we saw a light at the end of the tunnel. That was, things were looking a little bit better. And then we hear about this plan that the global rulers have, that they're going to reset everything, and you won't own anything, and, and, you know, but everything will be provided for, which makes you think, okay, wait a minute, what about my business? Who's, what do you mean everything's going to be provided for me? And, and I... And, Go, go to the World Economic Forum and click on their little 10-minute video that talks about what they say is going to come in the next 10 years. If that doesn't shock you, nothing will. But back to my point, we see these things coming and we're like, oh man, and we get hit with blow after blow after blow. Do you remember that's what Paul said? He said, the enemy has been battering me. And the, the, the word there means he's been hit. You know, when he talked about one thing after another, shipwrecked and, and beaten and stoned and left for dead. And that the, the word that Paul uses there means I've just been hit with blow after blow after blow after blow. <clears throat> but it's interesting because then you come to the place where it says, but though I, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And I think most of us, including myself, need a whole lot more revelation on that. But my point is this. In the midst of all those things, are you, are you pushed enough to the place like the Israelites were here. Are you pushed enough to the place where you're back to, okay, God, all right, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm gonna get my nose in the Bible. I'm gonna stand on your word. There's nothing else that I have. My degree is not working for me anymore. My business is struggling. You know, I'm gonna have to rely on the government for finances. I don't want that. I'm not gonna go there. So I'm gonna trust you. And all of a sudden, when you get to the place that your faith is the only thing that you're hanging on to, your faith starts to work like it never has before. It starts to work because all the trappings of the world that we've become so comfortable with get removed from us. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a sad thing, but I believe that a big part of why this is happening to us in the Western world, the rest of the world as well, but in the Western world, is because God has to wake the church up and let the church know, look, you guys are so content with your bank accounts and your mortgages and your RSPs and all those things <clears throat> Uh, that you need to get your focus back on me. You need to have your faith in me. When your financial portfolio collapses, you need to have your faith in me. And unfortunately, it's the removal of some of these things around us. And I'm, you know, I'm the first guy to say that God wants to bless us, that God wants us to prosper. You know, 3 John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that you might prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. But I always wish he didn't put that as your soul prospers part in there. Because your soul is what links you and I to this world. It's what links you and I to our, our intelligence and our ability to accomplish. It's my soul that does all that. Well, if my soul is hooked into the world system, then when the things begin to shake in the world system, my soul is not prospering. And that's where your soul has to be brought over and hooked up with your spirit, where spirit says, you know what? My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory. We are going to come through this because the Bible says dot, dot, dot. And if you don't know what the Bible says, then you're going to struggle coming through it. And by the mercy of God, but what he'll do is bring you back again and again and again. So get your focus back on heaven's agenda. Refocus on the kingdom of God, which is working right now on our behalf. I don't know how many of you noticed um, but at our Good Friday service just over a week ago, the, the sense of victory that was in the house right from the first song. I mean, you know, here we are dealing with all this stuff again in the world. But the, the whole night, this was just over a week ago, was so full of victory. There was a sense of, of the, the, the sovereignty of God and the power of God. There was a sense of this, wow. And I remember looking over at the other guys and we're all kind of like, this is awesome. And I thought to myself, yeah, and then on Sunday morning, last Sunday, second service, same thing happened. There was a sense in the, in the worship, in the, uh, uh, you know, as I don't remember how much of it was praise and how much of it was worship. I just remember the sense of victory and joy being there. And I believe that's part of why the Lord reminded me, you've got to step from all this stuff in the world over here into the kingdom where it says, wait a minute. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I trust my God. 
I trust my God to bring me breakthrough. I trust my God that he's going to get me and my family through all of this. We're going to come out better. Even if the world gets worse, you and I can get better. Even if the world gets worse and harder, you and I can walk in something that's better. Refocus. 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 Look past the bad news in the world. Look past COVID. Look past lockdowns and restrictions. You know, people send me emails. Some of you, I think all you do is monitor all the things online that are bad that are happening. You know, people send me emails about, oh, the vaccine passport, you know, what are we going to do? Well, God will translate us if he has to. If they, but, but the process that's happening is people are waking up. The church is waking up. Even the world, they're waking up and going, wait a minute, this isn't true. You and I have something better than that. You and I have something better than, oh, what's, what are we going to do? You know, it's getting so bad. I'm telling you, God's plan hasn't backed off. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. The light shines more in the darkness than any other time. If the world continues to get dark, then that means the church is going to continue to get lighter. And you've got to watch yourself because you'll get caught up with the world. And then when you come in here on Sunday morning, we have to pump you up in the worship just to get you back to zero because you're so discouraged from all the stuff you dealt with that week. You've got to get your own nose in your Bible during the week. You've got to get with God during the week. You've got to put on praise and worship, you know, and like we did this morning, you've got to put something on so that you get your mind and your soul out of all that and you prepare an atmosphere for the Lord of the breakthrough. He's still the Lord of the breakthrough. He still wants to break through for you and me. He's still going to break through. He hasn't changed at all. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in the midst of the darkness, uh, this just so encouraged me yesterday. I thought, God, right in the middle of another set of lockdowns and people being sick and businesses struggling again and, you know, society is just like, "Mm -hmm." I find myself getting mad at our politicians. And then the Lord reminds me and says, look, they don't know. They don't know the difference. Get rid of that spirit of anger that you want to blame somebody and step over into what I've got for you like we did last Sunday morning. Step over into that so that you're carrying what I've got from heaven instead of being caught up with the things of the world. That's where the Lord of the breakthrough operates. He operates when you and I choose to go over here and engage the spiritual. When you and I choose to go over here and say, I trust you, Lord of the breakthrough, we're not going down, we're going further, we're not giving up, we're getting stronger, doesn't matter what happens in the world, you saw all of this before it ever even started, you saw it all, and you knew that those of us that were alive on the earth today would be fully equipped to overcome anything that comes on the earth today. We are not without the weapons necessary. We are not without the prayers necessary. We are not without the blood. We are not without the armor of God. We are not a handicapped generation upon whom the ends of the world has come and oh dear God, we just hold on to the end. That's not who we are. We are the champions of the king and he put you on this earth at this time and me. And I'm gonna tell you this, You just write it down. In 2021, there's going to be some breakthrough things that happen. The Lord of the breakthrough is going to start to do some stuff. There's some rumors that I've heard about some things. Oh, you guys, some of the things about the global uh, human trafficking thing. If you go and start to find out how many children, there was 150 children just the other day were discovered and brought out of this particular, one particular state in the U.S. that had been used for, for uh, sex trafficking. And it's happening all over the world. The, the, the stuff that God is doing, that he's getting ready to break something really, really, really big open. I'm telling you, 2021 is, is a tough year. It was the worst of times, but it's also going to be the best of times. <clears throat> Remember that the Lord of the breakthrough is still the Lord of the breakthrough. Remember that all you've got to do is turn towards him and say, look, I trust you. Lord of the breakthrough, what do I have to do? Bring it on for me and my family. Build your faith on the word. Get some prayer time. Make sure you're doing the same old things. I don't think things are going to ever go back to the way they were before because we've entered a different era. If we've entered a different era, that means that you and I have to grab a whole new set of tools to be able to walk in this era. But there's more, there's better, and there's stronger than they were before. I'm telling you, it's time for the Lord of the breakthrough. And it's time for your breakthrough. And it's time for my breakthrough. And you know what? The world's going to get some breakthrough here. 
I'm absolutely convinced, and I've shared that with, with, with our church, you know, with the greatest revival in the history of the world. We're already hearing raindrops falling and miraculous healings and, and people being raised from the dead and those sorts of things. But oh, I'm telling you, there's a breakthrough coming. There's a breakthrough coming for all of us. Hallelujah. Breakthrough coming for the church. When it's darkest is just before the dawn, I believe that there's a breakthrough that's coming, that, that the church is going to step out into something. Thank God for churches waking up. Thank God for churches standing up and saying church is essential. Thank God for pastors and congregations that are standing up and realizing what we've had given to us for so many years. We may have to fight for, but blessed be God. You know, you only fight so long, and then the Lord of the breakthrough goes, that's what I was looking for. Boom, and something happens, just like it did here in this story. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you this morning in the name of Jesus that you are the Lord of the breakthrough. You are still the Lord of the breakthrough. You still do breakthroughs for people, and you're doing breakthroughs for the body of Christ, and you're doing breakthroughs for this old world that really needs to see your hand, that really needs to hear your voice, that really needs to know that there is a Savior, and there is a God who's a good God. And so many people, all they know is the hatred of the devil and the meanness of the world and terrorism and fear and job loss. But Father, you have a plan to show the world that your goodness never changes. And I pray for everybody that's watching today, for those who might watch this video later on, in the name of Jesus, you start to cry out to the Lord of the breakthrough. Start to call out to Bill Perism. Thank you, Father, that you're breaking through on my behalf. I pray for breakthroughs for people. I pray for breakthroughs for churches. I pray for breakthroughs for pastors who've been discouraged and, and, and disenfranchised and dismayed and afraid. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the boldness of the Holy Ghost to rise up on your church so that we know that the Lord of the breakthrough can operate for us and with us and through us for the sake of this world world. We ask you for that. I ask you for that for every person watching today. May their hearts be stirred. May their faith be encouraged. May their hope be restored. And may your goodness manifest in each person's life as the Lord of the breakthrough. Hallelujah. I preach myself happy in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a tremendous week. We're doing this one more time next week, and then we're going to be back the week after that. But glory to God. Have a blessed, healed, strong week, everybody. Lord of the breakthrough.